Welcome to the one within all, and thanks for tuning in to episode 111 of Interverse. I'm your host, Chance Garten, and today I am honored and more than a little bit stoked to bring you a conversation with a dude who has been a true role model and teacher for me through his work. Today we have a magical metaphysical martial artist, the man with the plan to take down tyranny and choke it to sleep once and for all, the Canadian truth warrior himself, David Whitehead. Through his work, hold on, I've got a little more. Yeah, through his work on his website and podcast, Way of the Truth Warrior, David has forged a path to authentic self-esteem and total liberation for the body, mind, and spirit from the anxieties, tensions, and traumas that cause so many to identify as victims. By constantly reminding us that our past struggles and scars aren't crippling wounds, but badges of honor, David has led the way through example to help redefine masculinity in a world that desperately needs enlightened spiritual warriors. As a teacher and student of martial arts, philosophy, health, conspiracy, and more, he's recently teamed up with the legendary occult researcher Michael Tessarion with the Unslaved podcast. And I totally agree with David's assessment of Unslaved as the hottest thing on the internet. And over the last several months, as a premium member to their site, I've dramatically improved my own philosophical education. And I can honestly say, you won't find a better single place to learn about these things anywhere on the internet. These guys always cram their videos and podcasts so full of links to books and other researchers that you can literally gain a world-class level of knowledge from Unslaved that will dramatically un change your perspective on life for the better. One of my favorite psychologists that comes up on Unslaved is the great Wilhelm Reich. And I want to open our chat with David with a quote from his book, Listen, Little Man. It is high time for the living to get tough, for toughness is indispensable in the struggle to safeguard and develop the life force. This will not detract from their goodness as long as they stand courageously by the truth. There is ground for hope in the fact that among millions of decent, hardworking people, there are only a few plague-ridden individuals who do untold harm by appealing to the dark, dangerous drives of the armored average man and mobilizing him for political murder. There's but one, an but one antidote to the average man's predisposition to plague, his own feelings for true life. The life force does not seek power, but demands only to play its full and acknowledged part in human affairs. It manifests itself through love, work, and knowledge. I think that's really great and chock full of information, that quote. And now before we begin with this chat between me and David and begin unpacking the ideas from that quote and more, I want to remind you there's an extended two-hour version of the podcast available for Plus members. This show has zero advertisements and only one source of income, and that's you guys, the listeners. I typically find that the second hour is deeper and more fascinating than the first since it takes time to lay down foundational ideas to get to the more dynamic concepts. And I'm sure this chat with David Whitehead will be no different. So if you want to access that, go to patreon.com forward slash interverse or simply check the show notes to become a member. Thank you to all current members for your generous support. And remember, the show notes will also have links to David's work on Truth Warrior, Unslaved, and notes to things that we've been talking about. So now that we've got these introductions out of the way, let's all take a second to remember our breath and find that inner balance and stillness, the infinite space within from which our power emerges. We are the microcosm of the universe, and this vastness within you contains the blueprint of all that is. So we need to remain cognizant of that, our true power. And while doing so, let's set our intentions to learn something from this talk that can change our lives for the better, to help us become the infinitely powerful, creative, and omnificent beings that we are. With our perspectives now properly aligned to our magical potential, please join me in welcoming David Whitehead, Truth Warrior, to the universe. Thanks for coming on, David. You have no idea how glad I am to get a chance to speak with you. Beautiful, Chance. Thank you so much uh, and for the kind words and a great introduction and for what you do with your show. Um, I absolutely encourage your listeners to go and support you so you can continue to do this work. It's an honor to be here with you today, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. I guess let's start by telling everyone about your history working on Truth Warrior and more about the Unslaved podcast. Yeah, well, the Truth Warrior, I guess, concept that I uh, built my first podcast around my I was on radio with this show. Um, it was just a concept that I came up with years ago. You got to give your show a name. You've got to have uh, an intention put into your work, I think, and something that sort of encapsulates you. 
I see that you've got innerverse, and I love that term. It, 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 I'm sure it encapsulates uh, the philosophies that inspired you. And it's the same with me with Truth Warrior. Um, I grew up as a martial artist, uh, starting at the age of nine. I gravitated towards martial arts because, like all young children, we're all needing certain nutrients of consciousness, let's just put it like that, such as self-esteem, self-respect, self-knowledge, uh, the ability to introspect, the ability to have empathy and compassion, uh, the ability to have and develop sensitivity, um, to understand your body, your mind. It's funny, you, you read a, qu a quote from Wilhelm Reich. Uh, first of all, I highly recommend everybody read that book of his. It's a short read. Listen, little man, it's excellent. It's kind of like the talk with your dad that you never got. <laughs> and, um, but he talked a lot about something called somatic intelligence, which is essentially a therapeutic way of helping people using body work and shadow work. If you look at kind of comparing him with Jung, it's a really interesting mix. And I found that, full, like it was actually Michael Desarian that introduced me to Wilhelm Reich and got me into those concepts. But I was reading all about this philosophy in the various warrior traditions and martial art traditions that I grew up studying and, and loving. And so uh, what I did was I kind of combined a philosophical approach to warriorship in modern times. And this is just, it's basically using the warrior as an archetype in the same way that maybe Joseph Campbell would speak about the hero, the journey of the hero. It's very similar in, this, in the terms of uh, the warrior, right? The one who stands when no one else will stand. The one who has courage. The one who uh, creates. Uh, not just destroys the one who is able to defend virtue, goodness, truth, and justice, as opposed to being run over by tyrants. Uh, this was sort of an archetype that I believe we all have embedded in us. It's been uh, a part of our filiogenetic memory since you know time immemorial. Uh, many of the warrior traditions have a deep respect for ancestry, and as would you see in say the native or Aboriginal cultures. And I have a deep, uh, I, I, drew, I gravitated towards that idea that in us somewhere is this will to survive, this will to fight back against tyranny, this will to uh, create ourselves, to actively participate in this life, to overcome obstacles, to learn how to understand who we are, why we're here, where we're going, which are the biggest philosophical questions of, our, of, of humanity. And the concept of truth then came from my personal pursuit of truth. And I just want to give always the same disclaimer that when I, when you hear that, that term truth warrior, I'm not trying to say, Hey, come over here, talk to me. I'm the guy that has the truth. We've got a lot of people out there that are doing that already. That's not this at all. It's all about a sincere pursuit of trying to align with the truth. And you have to discover what that is on an individual level, just in your everyday life, you know, the truth of who you are, the truth about your own strengths and weaknesses, the truth about your own um, ambitions and goals and dreams in life, but then also the truth about the world you live in, the time you live in, the moment of history that you live in. And then you can expand that into the, the bigger ideas of you know the truth about the nature of the universe, the nature of reality, the cosmos, divinity, God, extraterrestrials, what, whatever you want. You're pursuing truth and you're pursuing it honestly. And that you won't always find it. You'll, there's lots of red herrings that'll get in the way. There's lots of deception. There's lots of um, things that we conceal from ourselves to block us from seeing the truth. So that's why it brings it back to a very personalistic view of to be a warrior is to be an individual first that is empowered, that has their own armor on so that you can go and affect great change in the world, as opposed to trying to affect great change in the world before addressing the temple of yourself first. So it's a different concept. Um, a lot of it was inspired by people like Bruce Lee, Mor Hayashiba, Gut Kitchen Funakashi, Jigoro Kano, um, even other modern day martial artists that I've had the honor of growing up training with that taught me that martial arts and warriorship is not just about learning how to fight, learning how to win, um, all that kind of stuff. It's about learning how to win in life. It's, a lear it's about learning how to be a victor in life instead of a victim. And that was what spoke to me. And then, uh, you know, the truth part came from the philosophy, study of philosophy, history, et cetera. So that was my own personal, it's sort of, that's my personal journey. And you'll notice if you've watched me since like, say 2007 in my first YouTube video and all the interviews I've done, you'll see that there's points that I've changed my opinion on as time has gone, which I think is a natural progression. We all do that. Um, and I think that's something that's healthy. Because I've honestly been that person that, like, I recognize I have my own innate biases. I have my own experience. I, I have my own way of seeing things. 
but I'm the kind of person that I'm open to new information. I'm opening to good arguments that are convincing. I'm open to looking at facts and evidence and research that I haven't seen before. And even though I've sort of got my own perspective now, I'm recognizing that this process of pursuing truth is something that has to evolve and grow. And that's what led me to someone like Michael Tessarian. I came across his work probably in, yeah, about 2006, 2007. I got his, uh, his, his, um, his fantastic DVD series that he did back in the day and I couldn't stop watching it. It was, which you can get, you can get on unslave.com now. I've watched it all there. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, it was one of those things that, that was Michael putting out his research and his journey. And, uh, and then I eventually contacted him and was like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm hosting a show right now. I was hosting a show on American freedom radio. I was covering for another host and, uh, I needed some guests. So I thought, Oh man, Michael's been somebody I looked up to for a long time. I had some email communication with him at the time. And I said, Hey, why don't you come on the show? He agreed to, and he and he and I really hit it off. And he just, kept staying in touch with me. We kept doing more shows. And then we embarked on uh, some other projects like Path of the Fool. Um, and we did the MSAR Conspiratorium where we would host him live and have people in a room as well as online asking questions and starting discussions. It was awesome. And then I went out uh, with my friend Chris Rusak from Toronto. We flew out to Ireland and uh, Michael was there at the time doing research for his, his books. And we did the live presentation of the female Illuminati program, which you can also see on Unslave. Um, and we just, we developed, uh, a, I think, a good, not just a, a professional relationship, but even a personal, you know, student mentor, brother to brother type relationship as well, where we said, hey, let's put our minds together. Let's put our resources together and let's try to really do justice to this work because I'm sure as you know, Chance, I mean, it's it's incredibly hard to just start a show and start a you know, start doing this. Um, but as technology has advanced, we now have the capability of doing it in a way that we could never even dream of before. And so that's where the birth of Unslaved was, was I was seeing, hey, there's other ways of doing media than spending millions of dollars on production in order to do it. So let's start it. Let's just, I didn't know anything about it. Let's get into it, right? So that's what Unslaved was, it was kind of an experiment. And we've been through all the ups and downs, made a lot of mistakes technically in the beginning, but that's normal. And now we've ironed out a product that I believe stands apart and we're actually about to upgrade it even further. We're, we're investing heavily into really bringing it to the next level so the users have more interactivity. We've got live interactive uh, chat rooms. We have a private social media. So essentially it's, it's Facebook, but it's our own Facebook that we've customized and built. We're going to be building that into Unslave. So people are afraid of being hounded by every post they make and censored and shouted down by trolls. Uh, you know, we're creating a place where you can come into an exclusive zone. We have like-minded people where you can have rational discourse and debate. You're not just all in agreement. You're all debating and discussing and sharing. Um, and it, it just surrounds the whole vibe of Unslave, which is we're trying to stay on a path of being sincere, operating with integrity and trying to build the best product we possibly can. And, uh, and this is what we want to do. So Unslave was born out of a desire to really just help the production match the the level of research that Michael brings. And so uh, that's that's where that was born. Yeah, the level of research you're talking about with Michael Tassarion is unparalleled. Like that guy can recall things like nobody else and has clearly read 10 times more books than most, you know, PhD professors ever will. And I really appreciate that about it, that the sources are constantly being linked there. And that process you talked about of changing your mind about things and getting new information, that's something that definitely will come about if you're listening to Unslaved. I can't claim that I've always agreed with every perspective, but from every guest or even from necessarily you or Michael, but that's good. That's part of the critical thinking process. Right. You know, no, no one person is the truth. Like you said, being a truth warrior isn't about beating other people to death with your version of the truth. It's about fighting in service of truth. Yes. And so that means that you have to be able to say the three most magical words in the English language, which is I was wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've said I was wrong quite a few times about some things that I thought that I knew the full story on and then got a little more context by listening to you and Michael or the guests you've had on. I've even had a couple, uh, um, 
I've even checked out many of the books and had Matt Presti on, who you guys hosted oh, early great. on. Yeah. He's a great guy. What I wanted to say about this concept of the spiritual warrior, though, my personal understanding of it is kind of simple. It starts with the foundation of, in your own mind, being the warrior on the wall that watches the thoughts as they come by. And this is like a mindfulness thing. It comes from my background in meditation is where I learned this, but it's about realizing your thoughts are not you. You don't have to identify with thoughts, especially not ones that make you weaker. And being the warrior on the wall is watching them as they come and changing or discarding the ones that are not empowering and not aligned with truth. And how do you know whether or not something is aligned with truth? Well, to me, the biggest secret that you could uncover about yourself and who you are is that you're an omnificent being. And omnificent is different than omnipotent or omnipresent. Omnificent means possessing full creative power. And so that means you literally get to choose what you are in every moment. You get to create yourself. That's what being a human being is. And so, yeah, the spiritual warriorship for me, it it starts and ends with watching my own thoughts and uh, seeing, learning my own biases that way, learning my own fears and anxieties, figuring out where I'm victimizing my own self with uh, what I identify with. And that's, that's a huge thing. So that all ties in very directly to one of the main topics I wanted to have you speak on today, which is the philosophy of self-esteem. And so what could you say about that? Yeah, well said there, Chance. And I would just say, just to finish up uh, the last part of that was um, that when it comes to the way that we decided to conduct interviews on Unslaved, it was with the idea of presenting all of the information to people as much as we possibly could. We even brought guests on that we maybe disagree with 75% of their particular stance, but we really loved a certain aspect of one thing that they talk about, which is really crucial. That's how Michael's always operated. That's how I've always operated. We can learn from everybody. We're all human beings that have different points of light to express. And you can also learn from your adversaries as I've known from training martial arts, you know, many years. So sometimes you want to hear from the dark side just to know, hey, what do you think about it? Or call it the dark side, just call it an, an opposing point of view, let's say. It's important to do that uh, as you're trying to uncover the truth because the truth is surrounded by a circus. Let's, let's all agree on that. The real truth about things is often surrounded by a circus. And it's hard to, for the average person to wade through that. But the thing is, is that that inner voice that we all have, you could call it your your true self, your, 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 you know, the God or essence within you or the divinity within you, however you want to look at it. That's not something that is going to turn the, its own volume up so that you can hear it. It's always at a static. It's always in a, in a, in a specific tone in your being. And it's up for you to turn your noise down. As this is the process you're talking about being the warrior on the wall, turn the noise down so that you can hear the source of who you are, as opposed to just, you know, the battle that's going on inside of all of us, you know, the battle between the ego, the super ego, the, the compartments of our consciousness, um, the programming that we've received from the world, from society, from our peers, from our parents, from whatever. Um, there's so many, there's so much baggage that comes with us as well, but that doesn't mean that we don't have that still small voice within that we can draw upon that I believe is connected to what you could call nature or the universe or the divine or God or the Tao or whatever you like to conceptualize it as. So um, I just wanted to encourage that. Now, when it comes to self-esteem, I made a couple notes here that, you know, essentially let's break it down into three components that if you can, can if you can accept these three components about what makes you a human being, then you'll start to have a I think a more holistic and empowering perspective of this process of self-esteem and you'll stop seeing this self-esteem thing as just this arbitrary thing that, yeah, it'd be nice to have a little more self-esteem. You'll start to see it as a necessity of consciousness in the same way that having the right vitamins and minerals in your body, you know, micro, uh, macronutrients, micronutrients, having all that present at the cellular level is important for your physical health, well-being, and survival. Your consciousness, what we call our consciousness, is, is the same thing. It, it needs certain nutrients in order for it to flourish. If it's deprived of those nutrients, it will implode on itself and it will eat itself. Okay. And it will, we can break it down about how this happens physically in the brain as well as psychically or however you want to look at it. All right. So the three components are this. If you can accept these, 
the idea is that number one is that man is a rational being that is able to conceptualize. Now, rational doesn't, I mean, we're talking rational as just one of the components of, of you, the, the physical brain, the logical center of the brain, the ability to, to sit here and listen to what I'm saying and decide whether you're, you're, you're for it or against it or what your thought, the ability that you have to conceptualize and see something in your mind. And as we're having this conversation, you are actively involved in this process of having this discussion, even though maybe you're not speaking directly, your brain, you using rational and reason you're using your rational centers and your reason to differentiate whether what I'm saying is agreeable or disagreeable. Okay. So we, we agree that we have that level of um, understanding and we have that sort of built into the pra- to the package. All right. So you're, you're a rational being, you have the ability to conceptualize right away. That separates you from um, all other living things. It doesn't put you in a place where it's this higher or lower. It just means that humanity has this gift that is unique. Okay. Second is that reason is our basic means of survival. All right. So the, it, it, basically if you're lost, if like I live out in the West coast of British Columbia, right. In Canada. And, you know, right now I'm in a warm, cozy room, but you know, the other day there was a massive storm. If I were to be lost in the woods during that massive storm and I didn't possess the ability to protect myself from the elements, to hunt and gather food, to gather resources, to find a source of heat, to try to stay dry. If I didn't have that, I would die. And human beings would not have evolved to this point or gotten to this point. So it's because we possess reason, not necessarily the thickest skin. We're not the toughest things on the planet. We're probably the weakest physical beings on the planet. But we have this advantage, which is reason. We have the ability to learn information, to um, make decisions on a per second basis about what is the best way to move forward in order to just starting off to achieve survival. But then we achieved something greater than that, didn't we? We, did, we got past the point of just getting by to survive. You know, there's still obviously many places in the world where they're still in a very survival mode of consciousness, but we have achieved a, an ability to get past that. Here we are on the internet right now. As I said, I'm in a room that has heat. There's hot running water next to me. I have a grocery store right beside me here. We've achieved a certain level through using our reason in order to, to get that. Okay, And let's be clear, we don't always use these faculties very well, but we have access to them nonetheless. The third one is that man is a being of volitional consciousness. And this is what you were talking about, Chance. Volition is just talking about freedom, free will. You have, the, you have free will. Now, you're, this is a debate in philosophy that goes back to the beginning of philosophy it's a debate that's come up once again with the, the rise of atheism and materialism. This is crucial to you having an understanding of who and what you are and your ability to navigate this reality with those nutrients of consciousness that I was telling you that you need. When you're deprived of the knowledge that you have free will, you are now disempowered. I believe that. Okay, And I believe there's more than enough evidence for the average person to understand that there are some things in the universe that are fixed. I mean, there are things that are determined that are outside of our control, but there's also things that are mutable. There are also things that you do have control over. So to put it all in one camp or the other, see, in the New Age movement, they try to say everything's mutable. You're this creator God that can do anything you want. There's no repercussions for your actions. Morality is subjective, not objective. And you basically, if you want to fly, you can fly. If you want to be a, if you want to now identify as a purple unicorn, um, from another dimension, then you can do that. There's no fixed laws of, of morality or reality anymore. Magical right? child thinking. There you go, right? So magical child thinking is the one extreme. And then complete materialist, determinist, you have no volitional consciousness, you have no free will, it's all predetermined from the day of the Big Bang onwards. That is the other extreme. So the, the, the real challenge of, of a philosopher or a person that is trying to get to the truth of who they are is to try to find that middle road, the corpus callosum in the brain. You have a left hemisphere of the brain, which is logic, reason, et cetera. You have the right hemisphere of the brain. That's your creativity. Your, uh, you could call it the masculine feminine balance, the yin and the yang. Um, you know, we, we have, we have this sort of schizophrenic mind. Okay. But when you, when you have a bridge, which could be looked at as that corpus callosum in the brain that connects up to the prefrontal neocortex and the third eye and all that kind of stuff. When you understand that you've been given these separate compartments 
But when you can holistically put them together to have them all working in harmony and synergy, this is the law of balance that we hear about in so many beautiful philosophies. And it starts with your brain, your consciousness, and your acceptance that you have a certain level of control over your actions. You're not just like a piece of lint that is floating in front that has no ability to change its course. And it's just subject to all these antecedent forces. And that's it. They're, they're trying to compare you to that. Or you're like a rock rolling down a hill. There's only one place you can end up. There's no way to deviate course. Okay. And then a logical person go, well, if I was physically rolling down a hill, I have the ability to suddenly wake up and stop myself in some way if possible. I have that ability to just go, I don't want to fall down the hill. I want to stop myself. And in martial arts, we're playing with this concept all of the time, every day, day in and day out. So how people can actually believe philosophically or materially that they have no free will at all, it's, it boggles my mind, but that's another thing. So those three components, real quick, man is a rational being that has the ability to conceptualize. Reason is your basic means of survival. Man is a being of volitional consciousness. If you can start there, then we can start talking about self-esteem and how important it is. But I'll let you weigh in there first, Jens. Yeah, I mean, there's so much more to even say about self-esteem. But man as a conceptual being, let's return to that for just a second. Because what that means is that you can hold abstractions in your mind to the extent that you can even conceive of the entire universe in your mind. So that means that your mind, mental space is pretty much limitless and infinite. And when you put that in context of certain things that seem determined, like, say, trauma that someone experiences as a child, right. you, people will make the argument that that is a valid excuse to be a victim in a way, or that there's no way that someone could have chose that for themselves. So it's an argument against free will, because why would someone choose to be, you know, raped or something? And they wouldn't nor necessarily. But when you take into a larger I take into context a lot of larger research topics like past life, uh, past life understanding. And, and this came up in your astro philosophy podcast that I was just checking out earlier today. This idea that, yeah, we have these zodiacal charts, these, these horoscopes that make it look almost like there's a certain level of determinism just about who we are. But if we can zoom out and and use that ability to abstract, to abstract even further and say that, well, our souls are something beyond this physical vehicle that inhabit this physical vehicle and the, ve the our physical body grows out of it. And that's part of understanding your somatic intelligence is that your body and your spirit are really one while you're in it. But the, the idea is that on this higher level, beyond lifetimes, between lifetimes, you're picking the point that you come in and getting your you're casting that chart for yourself based on where you were when you last left off and the choices you're making then. So even something that seems sort of set in stone, like certain life events that you could possibly correlate to your astrological chart, those are still on a higher level, a type of choice. Now, everything is built by choice, I would say. And that's one of the most important things to realize as a conceptual being is that everything that everything that you are is rooted in choice on some level of abstraction or even a uh, very direct physical level. Very well stated, Chance. Uh, very good. Um, the, I'm really glad you mentioned that episode. I love that episode because I think, I, I think it was that episode or one of the other ones we did on astrology where I asked the question about how, well, in a way, astrology could be, especially the way it's taught, which is complete nonsense, but the, the way it's taught, people look at astrology as fatalism. It's fate. Fate is in the stars. You can't, it's, it's another form of determinism. But the fact is, that's not at all what astrology is referencing. It's kind of, here's an example. I have this microphone. I have an SM7B. I love this microphone, but it's very touchy and it takes a lot of settings to get it perfect, right? So it comes with factory settings, okay? Kind of like you, you're born in the world, you have your factory settings, right? But that doesn't mean that's the only option that you have. That just means it has attributes. This mic has certain attributes to encapsulate sound and, and reverberate it back with, through vibration. And we have all these different ways of doing that. And it, you know, and it has different ways of expressing sound, but you can tune it. You can change the, the pitch, the bass, the treble, all that. And you can make your voice sound like a robot if you want. Like it, there's different ways to set using the predetermined, by the creator of it, the predetermined 
factory settings plus all the variations that are input into it. I mean, think of your computer or your phone comes with factory settings and then you tweak it and personalize it with your favorite desktop background or whatever. Oh, can I throw in a good example of this real quick? So I'm a Pisces and a few weeks back, my wife said, you know, I've read that it was a Piscean trait to leave your clothes on the ground and not put them in the laundry hamper. And after that, I have not left a single fucking piece of clothing on the floor. And I was like, this is not who I am. I can choose to be whatever I want. It doesn't make so you've just us. proven it. Exactly. You've just proven it. Like you were on a course that could have been predetermined to you either by some materialist big bang or by some weird conceptualization of magical rocks in space that you are now forever destined because of your Piscean nature to be like this. Now that just, that might mean that you have a natural proclivity or a, um, there are, we all have personality traits and characteristics. And part of that is maybe universal. And part of that might be your, 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 gen your genetics, your parents. And then, and then there's all the other influences like, the way you were brought up. Maybe you did experience trauma. Maybe you had a perfect upbringing. Maybe there's all these maybes. There's all these factors that come into making. We're incredibly complex. And that's why I hate when we're boiled into one of two things. We're either completely fatalistic or we're completely loosey-goosey. There's no rules. And the fact is, is that it's got to be that there's elements of both embedded into the universal structure. So the fact that you can change direction, and I've done it many times. I've had bad habits that I've changed and now I have good habits. Like I do, again, martial arts is just so amazing and, and there's many skills. There's so many ways, but working with the body, let's say, right? It's, I've always said it's kind of like a scientific lab where you can experiment, you can uh, prove ideas right or wrong by saying, okay, for example, in, uh, in martial arts, maybe I'm setting up a, a roundhouse kick, okay? And maybe the way I've been doing it, it, it always sort of shows my opponent that I'm about to do that kick. So that's why I never land that kick. And this was a problem that I had. I was too obvious about telegraphing the move. So pretty much every opponent, didn't matter their rank, they always saw it coming. I was like, how come I've never landed a roundhouse kick? It's always my goal, right? And then when I finally had an instructor come and saying, well, you're, you're turning your hip out too much first, your knee is coming out here, and then it's coming. So it's easy to see. It's in their peripheral vision, right? The way to do it is to come direct up the center line and fake and set it up with a fake and then kick. And the way he tweaked it, now it's like, even when people knew it was one of my favorite kicks, I could still land it at will. Well, what was the difference? Was I predetermined to only kick one way by my genetics and by the explosion of the Big Bang, that whatever? No, I was doing it wrong. And now I'm doing it right. I corrected my course. I changed it by a process of activating my will. Because it wasn't just about hearing it and going, oh, yeah, I was logically inconsistent there. I got to change that. It was I had to show up to the gym every day and change the way I threw that kick and deprogram the old way I was doing it so that I could then introduce, sort of like download a new software update so that now it's performing better. But I had to make the choice to sh wake up, brush my teeth, get my gym bag, eat healthy, not go partying the night before, go to the gym, be humble, don't walk in there saying, I got it all figured out. Like you, you make little decisions every single second of every single day. Like I could have said to you, Chance, I don't want to come on your show today. I'm busy. No, I made the choice to sh shave out some time in my day to come on the show and have this awesome chat. That was my choice. You made the same choice. And now we're meeting together. And then you mentioned something about trauma or when, when you know, something about how, uh, you know, there's other people that are going to affect your path. Of course, because everybody has free will. You're not the only one that has free will. Everybody has it. So people can use that not just for good. Obviously, we don't have free will doesn't mean you're only making correct decisions. Free will means you can mess up, you can make mistakes, you can go to uh, an action that is going to um, hurt another person, or you can take an action that's going to help another person or whatever, right? You can harm yourself or you can help yourself. These are choices we make. So you're living in a world of other people that have their own will and they're exercising it based on their integrity, their concept of morality, and their worldview and their philosophical an epistemological worldview. So that means you can't create these hive collective type entities and call that real. Collectives are made up of individuals that are all making choices. And this is why we've been ranting and railing lately also about the whole identity politics thing, the communism, the socialism, because these are just political manifestations of an error in thinking philosophically. And that's why we're batting the ball back between philosophy philosophy, politics, ancient history, 
divination arts, numerology, back to politics. Like we're, we're batting the ball because we're trying oh, to you throw some music in there. Throw some music, music and creativity, creativity, martial arts, you know, the, all these different amazing things. And um, I just think that, Hey, maybe you're a person that, that does believe in determinism and you're a Sam Harris advocate and whatever that's more power to you. But I would just say that, you know, you do need to hear the other side of the argument and you need to use your free will in order to decide what side of the camp you are on. So even with the idea, I love how it's like the determinists are like, well, it's all determined. It's like, well, is, is my decision to not believe in determinism fate? And is your, yours on the other side, the same or, don't we have to, aren't you trying to convince me now and change my mind about the way I think? And is there not yeah, that a just proves of free will? Exactly. It so it proves it. I don't think we have to heart more on that, but I think it's important again when it comes to this idea of self-esteem, which we started with, which I think is so important. And the number one book of all time on the subject, it comes from Nathaniel Brandon. It's called The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. I recommend you can probably get the audio book on YouTube. Or, or an Audible, but get the physical book. I got it for five bucks in a used bookstore. It is the best writing on the subject ever. Um, and I think that, uh, that that whole discussion that he started in that book was something that um, I've, I've seen started by other writers and authors that I think it just came together perfectly. And so I highly recommend it. But the, the thing I would say about self-esteem is that we're not talking about some kind of narcissistic ego-based version of it where you just get to do whatever you want and trample over everybody and you're this narcissistic sociopath. That's not true. In fact, narcissism is defined first in psychology as self-sadism. It comes from self-sadism. So if it comes from self-sadism, there's nothing esteeming about it. It's a hatred of the self that produces the narcissistic sociopath. They then have no ability to love to have empathy for others because they have no love or empathy for themselves. So can you see how this can really start to twist things in society? If our kids are not being taught this from day one and it's being pounded into them instead of all the other things that are being pounded into them, such as you're not good enough, uh, you know, bow to authority, don't think for yourself, memorize and repeat. You're too fat. You're too short. You're too tall. You're not this, you're blah, blah, blah. Or nowadays in schools, Oh, sorry, you're white. You must walk around in shame and guilt for the rest of eternity. And, you know, we're going to bring all that stuff into the mix. This kind of nonsense, I don't care how it's put together, is what's destroying the minds of these young children. What they need is empowerment, self esteem, martial arts, uh, spirituality, philosophy, free thinking. This is what is the nutrients of the soul. And it's being deprived of these young children and it's twisting our society as a result. So, one of the manifestations of pathological narcissism is kind of the inability to act the paralysis just like the the myth of narcissus just looking at his own reflection eternally and never doing anything else cursed by the gods to do so as it turns out but that's another story <laughs> right right uh so a lot of us in our quest to become a more fulfilled and creative and authentic person we do run up against this resistance that is in the form of just wanting to sit there and not do anything. And why I think it's important for us to be studying psychology and philosophy and understanding the nuances of narcissism is that it's a spectrum. You might be a pretty yeah. good person. Like you might be a very good person with the best of intentions. I feel that about myself. But as I listen to Unslaved and learn from some of the greatest philosophers that have ever written a word, I keep finding places where I am falling more on the narcissist spectrum or more on the narcissism side of the spectrum than I thought I was. And right. it's huge to make those connections because then you get to use your capacity as a conceptual, rational and free willed being to go, oh, I'm going to change that. And it's it's hugely empowering. One thing, though, that I, th I think can really help with the self-loathing that is at the core of this sort of paralysis, lack of imagination and inevitable narcissism is the idea of authentic shadow work. And mm -hmm. I've tried to talk about this on the show at different times, but I think as we are entering the, the home stretch of our free hour, 
one of the most important topics that we could broach is authentic shadow work because I think that is going to be the foundation of how someone develops their self-esteem to a healthy level. Yes, well said. Very important subject. We could probably do multiple shows on it. Um, and we have on Unslaved as well. Um, but essentially, the, the term shadow originally came from Carl Jung. Um, and he talked about shadow work. You could say shadow work. You could say spiritual work. You can use whatever word you want. But if authentic shadow work, as um, Michael has defined it on the show, is a talk is talking about embracing yourself as a whole being, meaning all the good, the bad, the ugly, everything and recognizing it and allowing yourself to introspect and sort out, okay, this is a part of my being. Why is it here? Why do I have this hatred towards this other person? Or why do I have this fear or this doubt in something that I shouldn't have? Or why do I have this propensity to, uh, you know, to hurt people verbally whenever I feel attacked, you know, or whatever it is like, these are little inklings of, of where this can go. And obviously in, um, in a uh, in a in a mind that has not done any kind of cleansing in that field, it gets it's like plaque build up. It builds up. It builds up. It builds up, and then that actually suffocates the other areas of the brain. And they've actually shown in in you know CAT scans and brain scans, um, you know people that essentially when you're not using parts of your brain, it actually starts to atrophy. It's kind of like your muscles. Like if I'm working out and I'm building muscle and I'm, you know, doing that, I'm going to feel stronger. I'm going to look stronger and I'm going to be able to act stronger. But when I stop that process or do things that will do the opposite of that, then obviously those muscles don't get used. They get weaker and they eventually atrophy. And so it's the same with consciousness. So you can't look at yourself only as the shining, gleaming angel of light. Uh, that is, we are dualistic beings. We have a good wolf and a dark wolf in us. And the old uh, Cherokee's tale is, you know, there's that wolf that ha has, you know, resentment, hatred, greed, you know, uh, narcissism, all those things. And then on the other wolf is the one with strength, courage, virtue, love, all these things. And the question from the young child to the elder is, well, which one wins this fight that's happening inside of us? Which wolf will be the winner? And the answer is, it's the one you feed. Whichever one you feed is the one that's going to win. So if you deny the fact that you have a dark side, that, you know, if we look at, um, if you look at, say, like Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia or China or wherever, any period of time you want, and you see all these people following this dictator and, and cheering on genocide and murder and, and being silent and not resisting and acting like slaves with a smile while all this horror is going on around them. And you're going to look at that and say, I would never do that. I'd be the guy saying, resist. I'd be the guy that wouldn't do. You're lying to yourself. Because look at the most people today. They are so easily influenced just by like a gust of wind will change somebody's mind these days. There's no steadfast, strong, uh, rooted, powerful people walking around. They're very rare. Okay. And so that means that and look at the media to look at the way the conversation about what's happening in the world right now is actually going on. Most people are the loudest people talking about these things are the most ill-informed about what's going on. Why would that be? And we're, we often go, well, look at them. And I'm not that I've been that too. I've been that I've done things I'm not proud of. I've thought thoughts that I'm not proud of thinking, but that doesn't mean I've gained, I've come to this point of hating myself. It just means that I've come to the realization that I'm not as impervious to all of this as I thought I was, which means I need to do more work to strengthen my being as much as I can, to stay as authentic as I can, to be honest about the shadow, to confront it on a daily basis. That's what's going to help me get through that point to where if I saw outright tyranny happening, or I saw an old lady getting mugged in the street, or I saw some child being abused, that I wouldn't be that passive sheep that just sort of go, oh, I don't want to see that. I'm, I know I've been strong enough to say, no, and that's when I'm going to take a stand. And I would be that person that would stand up to, to that kind of evil, you know, but it takes work, you know. We'll talk about how working with the body actually is involved in reaching that state where you might actually stand up against evil whenever it was in front of you. You know, and that's because I mean, it's such a big problem with a lot of new age mentality. And even many people that I love dearly, they want to say, well, don't look at bad things don't focus on bad things you make them get bigger or worse and that's actually not true yes you're 
energy flows where your attention is directed, but it's about the quality of the attention. So yes, if you're looking it. at evil and you're saying no with your attention, that is a negation. <laughs> that's the negation of negation as it's known in, in philosophy. That's how we reach the next level. It's actually the most, one of the most important parts of the process. But before you can even reach that part, you have to have your bio energy flowing. And so in the right hand sense, while we still have a few minutes here, you know, you're a martial artist. Can you talk about the way that these personality defects and ego trips actually live in our body as tension and and uh, held on to unreleased stuff? You know how the body is t sort of outside of time in that way and it's still right there remembering whatever happened until you deal with it? Yeah, you've done a great job of explaining it here, man. This is great. Um, so basically the way I would say it is that the way we view the body is that it's separated into compartments and this just becomes it's a part of psycho the way psychology went and the way that uh you know the way that scientific analysis went was to compartmentalize the body into all these different pieces so it's like you have a brain and then you have a body and then you have all these different parts of the body but the fact is you're a whole being you're a whole being and all processes affect other processes it's like nature right all of nature works synchronistically together it's not these separate, oh, there's trees and there's water and there's rocks. It's all part of this one flowing organism that is constantly expanding and changing and all of these things. So you're like that as well. As Schelling, one of the philosophers we reference a lot has said, is that nature is visible spirit and spirit is invisible nature. So it's just, we're in different points of perspective as to what's really going on and what reality is and where we fit in it. So from martial arts, we would say, okay, well, if you have any kind of anxiety or fear, it's going to come out in your performance, in your movement, meaning you're going to probably be very tense and spastic in your movement because there's tension and spasticity in your mind. So by allowing your body to loosen up and move more freely and doing body work, which is shadow work, you are releasing tension in your body and in your movement. And that in turn releases tension in your mind. So instead of going and sitting on some couch of some psychiatrist and just telling them all your sob stories, you're actually taking action, which enhances your self-esteem, by the way. It doesn't help your self-esteem to just talk to crying in front of somebody. It helps your self-esteem to feel like you're taking action, right? So you take physical action with the suggestion in your mind about what you're fighting against. So an example is I grew up with, is surrounded in a world of fear, anxiety, and depression, okay? Which is based on what I was going through. I won't waste any time on it, but I found that by doing two things, by playing music, I play a piano by ear, and by practicing martial arts, hitting a punching bag, kicking, rolling, wrestling, you know, all these different components, spinning a bow staff, working with objects, that when I would do those movements, I would put in my mind, like I'm fighting that fear that I have that isn't related to martial arts at all or music. It's just it's fear of whatever talking to that girl I like or fear of, that I feel all the time inside of me, that angst. I'm fighting that with my physical movement. And as I would do it, it would help. It would help me release. It would help me relax. And then I got better at it and more sophisticated with it. And um, in, uh, in, in the samurai and the ninja tradition, it actually comes from the, the, the far east, this, this idea of uh, the kujikiri, the mikyo. It's this idea of working with your hands. And if you understand that your hands represent all of the elements of your nervous system, your brain, all of that, when you can connect those two together, that's what builds artists and musicians and painters is that they can connect, they can put from their mind through their hands, which are the tool of creation onto a piece of paper or into a song or into a performance that you are actually, that's shadow work. That's true spirituality. It's not just sitting there still all the, there's time for stillness, but it's not just that. And, um, and also in, in martial arts, it's unique because we're studying the art of combat. So combat is not just you going out on the streets and cleaning up all the thugs and, and all the bad guys. Uh, combat is internal combat, first and foremost. It's clear, it's crystal clear across all the greatest founders of martial arts that they're like universal on this point. It's about building character. It's about doing your shadow work. It's about becoming a better person. It's about all these things. And the idea is that the movements match different thoughts and you combat thought through movement. And then you develop thought through movement and you create new thought through movement. 
movement and thought are synonymous. They work together. I wouldn't be able to move unless I thought of it first. And then there's other theories. We were just talking about it. Michael kind of blew my mind on Sunday when he was like, well, what about there's this new theory that says it's actually not thought then action. It's action then thought. And I'm like, oh my God, now I'm just, I got to refresh everything. But either way, what we're talking about is that synergistic connection between the mind and the body. And if you're suffering right now from any kind of anxiety, depression, or guilt that is illegitimate, or anything that you know is just, it's your brain is playing tricks on you, it's not legitimate, then physical movement and breathing, breathing is another huge thing in like Qigong and Tai Chi and all these things is a huge, huge therapeutic response to addressing that fear and that, that whatever it is you're dealing with. It won't fix it on day one. It has to become habitual. It has to become built into you. But I've seen it. I've worked with students. I've worked with people. I myself uh, have seen these progress that when I did it regularly um, and trained with conscious intention, applying my will to what I'm doing with a, with a goal in mind, I've changed my life to the point where I don't, I don't live in fear and anxiety anymore. And now I just want to help pay that forward by teaching these uh, lessons to those that will listen. Man, you just nailed it. That's exactly what I wanted you here to describe because I, I actually have come to this place organically through Qigong. You know, then hearing you guys talk about it as you do, I was like, perfect. This is actually describing what I experienced because through Qigong, the movements that I learned, I've just learned from the internet. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for actually having a teacher and a master, but I think I found a good source in terms of videos where the person, I got it. I got the person's book too. I tried to go all in and really learn what I was doing. And the movements that I learned correlated with different organs. And it's just like, just like colors correlate with chakras, color, correlate with notes on musical scales. Your organs actually correlate with different parts of that system too, including different thoughts, thought patterns, feelings, and emotions more like. So whenever you are doing a certain movement in Qigong that moves the energy through your kidneys, for example, you might, if you have the intention of releasing a certain type of particular flavor of anxiety or fear, because that's what it all, all the negative emotions are at their root is just a different flavor of fear. Then yeah. You have that specific tool or you might learn a mudra, a way of holding your hands and fingers that represents wanting to open up a certain thing. Like there's one that I use that opens up the lungs, just a certain way of holding your hands that actually mm. connects the circuitry in your body and makes your lungs have a little more energy flowing to them. There's all these ways that w with the intention added to it, even just simple stretching, I've experienced that too, not even doing qigong, quote unquote, but just doing simple stretching with the intention of I'm going to let this tension out of my body and let out whatever mental correlation is there as well. You'll find that you'll have even flashbacks of certain things that were kind of traumatic or things that you regret or worried about That's that will right. come up while you're doing it. But yeah. You know, it's not like when I was in PE as a kid and would do stretching. I never had any of that happen then because there was no correlating. It was just mechanical. Exactly. There was no intention of you're also doing this spiritual shadow work while you're doing this movement with your body. So this this is great, man. We got a couple minutes left in the free show. So why don't you tell people where to find the stuff you do and uh, give your give your sales pitch and then we'll take a, a short break. Thanks, man. Yeah. So Unslaved, uh, go and support us there. Unslaved.com is the site. Um, and we've got, as I said, within the next couple of weeks, we've got some massive upgrades that are going to come in and really make it an amazing experience. It's already amazing, but we're definitely kicking it up a notch. Um, Unslaved.com, we're hosting the show entirely on our website right now. We're just like you, Chance. We rely on our subscribers and people that support us so we can do this. And I recommend everybody support alternative media or support Put your dollars where your passion is. Support the people you love. Because uh, in this time, we don't want to only get our information from one source and be told what to think. We want to put our, our efforts into how to think. Uh, my personal website is wayofthetruthwarrior.com. I haven't updated that website in a bit because I've been so focused on other things. But um, I'm going to be rebranding that site very soon. It's just got some articles and some past episodes that I did on various things, especially about a lot of the stuff we've been talking about. So those would be the, the main. And then you can follow me on Instagram at DW Truth Warrior. I'm always posting stuff there. Um, Unslaved is also on Instagram. I, I put all kinds of cool esoteric stuff up there all the time, philosophical bits of wisdom and really cool stuff. So 
follow us over there, guys. And uh, I look forward to speaking to everybody in the second hour. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, David. Guys, I really want you to check out Unslaved. I would even, as crazy as it sounds, I'd rather you were a member of Unslaved than a member of Interverse Plus. As much fun. Do both. Do both. <laughs> do, do both if you can. I mean, that would be awesome. But it, as much fun as we have in the Plus extensions, and we're going to get into some extremely heavy duty, awesome stuff, probably on the topic of government and external control as our as our plus extension because i it feels like that's where we're going next that that was hinted at in the first half uh you guys what you're doing over on unslaved people are missing sometimes an entire two hours worth of show if you're not on the premium membership and everything connects together that is going on there i i cannot express how much i've learned just by listening and it's really kind of an easy way to just change the mental programming they've got to listen to this type of material because you can't very well listen to that and keep thinking all your self-defeating and anxious thoughts can you you can only do one or the other so make a make a good choice for yourself guys and thank you david for being here and we'll be back with our plus extension for members on the other side of this break There it is, people. Another beautiful conversation that we can be pondering on for many weeks to come. Thank you, David Whitehead, for coming on the show. I do hope that you come back multiple times, like you said, because I feel like I barely even touched the questions that I had prepared. And I knew that would be the case because you can only really cover so many topics in an episode. So I feel like that being said, we still did a great job having an extremely diverse conversation. And it was such a good talk that I even got my mind changed a little bit about some topics. I mean, if you've been listening to the show, then you know I'm pretty rah-rah philosophical anarchy. But this was the first time I've really got to have a discussion to weigh the pros and the cons quite so in a more balanced way. And I guess that conversation was really more part of the plus extension. So if you didn't hear that, you don't even know what I'm talking about. But the plus extension is the second hour of the show that is exclusive to members. And that was where I saved the more debate-worthy topics for David. I think in the first hour, we did a great job covering authentic shadow work and self-esteem, like really good job covering that, and hopefully gave people some good ideas and directions to look. I've been heavily researching Wilhelm Reich, who we talked about in this episode. And the more I study that guy, the more I realize that the science behind the notion that all the tension in our body is also carrying our trauma and it's what's oppressing us mentally and even in the external world to an extent, there's a connection there. And yeah, his science is really solid. I've been powering through his material and it's one thing to hear other people talk about a, a brilliant person, but to actually read their writing or in the case of what I do, listen to it in audio form, it gives you an entirely different window into that person than what anyone could tell you about them. And Reich's definitely one of those people. Same goes for David. I think that you guys would get a really good taste for what he's about by checking out Unslaved. And Michael Tesserion, who he works with over there, is one of the most incredibly interesting people to listen to speak I've ever heard. And hopefully I wasn't too much of a fanboy in this episode. Like I said, in the Plus extension, we did get into a more lively debate. I guess you could call it a debate. It was more like a respectful discussion where we both uh, you know, had our own way of looking at the topic, which was political and philosophical anarchy and what we thought would and wouldn't work about it. And yeah, like I said, I kind of have had a big shift in perspective about that. I still believe in personal individual sovereignty and anarchy of a sense, like you're your own ruler, nobody rules you. But obviously the rest of the world is not ready for a no law type of scenario. We don't have an entire population of enlightened people yet. And there's so much work I need to do on myself that I really ought to refrain from even trying to prescribe the best type of society to the rest of the world because yeah after we talked if you saw this in video form which there's a video version david had a good uh, camera you would see that david's background was this clean white studio space with a whiteboard 
on the side and just two katanas on the wall behind him. And then compared to my studio space, which is just like pure chaos, a bunch of possessions just sort of haphazardly stacked in the room in whatever way I first attempt made them fit. So anyway, after that conversation, I even cleaned up my studio quite a bit, got rid of a bunch of crap I didn't need, rearranged the furniture, built some shelves to actually store items in a more sensible way. All in all, it was a great upgrade for my creative space. So thanks for that, David. You probably didn't even realize you're going to uh, make me get my shit together in a literal way just by <laughs> your example of having such a good creative space there that you do your work in. And I've been, like I said, checking out the work of Wilhelm Reich, trying to put my money where my mouth is and work on these things for myself. And I'm really finding that it's true that fixing the somatic or the, the body-based tensions actually can improve one's standards of personal morality, which is like your own internal conscience, your own wanting to do something that's good. And I mean like objectively good and balanced and loving rather than feeling like you are compulsory having to do it because the world would expect it of you and all that. And that, with that in mind, like I said, we're not ready for like a true political anarchy, and that was a big topic of the PLUS extension. But if we could somehow fix this emotional plague, as Wilhelm Reich calls it, that has got so many people wound up and blocked off from their own internal energy, Maybe the, nat the supposed natural tendency of some people to prefer stealing over creating for themselves or working hard, maybe that would kind of go away to a large degree. And then maybe we could actually start talking about an enlightened form of anarchy. But like I said, my position has kind of changed from talking to David, and it was sort of shifting just from listening to a lot of what they talk about on Unslaved because you can't – I mean the, the, the history of what man has done to man – in, in the name of collectivism, it doesn't lie. I mean, we, we can argue about the details, but we know there have at least been some violent shit that's gone down in the name of my idea is right and yours isn't. And, you know, anarchy, unfortunately, as beautiful as it sounds, you can't force it because if you told – if you started to be an anarchist in a literal sense and you became even like maybe militant and defending your territory, well, that big group of people that's acting – together calling themselves an army or a government they I guess they have you know they have the freedom to do that even if you think that that system is wrong so basically we it'd be really hard to have full worldwide anarchy because there's always going to be some people that want to be collectivists and then like david said i'm kind of spilling the beans on part of his argument but the fact that how would our economic system really play out like People would have their own private security or groups of people or tribalism would easily arise. And then once you have groups that have a force differential acting against each other, how is that much different than what the tyrannical governments we have today are doing? So, you know, we don't want to trade one system for another. I'll repeat the quote from William Blake that I brought up in the episode, which is the hand that crushes the tyrant's head becomes a tyrant in his stead. That's not the exact quote, it's a paraphrase, but it's in every movie, right? Like the rebels eventually get corrupted once they take power over the empire and then they're the new empire and the Star Wars saga will have 100 movies over the next 20 years. <laughs> I guess I've been talking a long time, so maybe I should tell you more about what we got, got into in the plus extension. Like I was bringing up that market example of... Uh, someone having a force to possibly impact a supposedly free market and why a monopoly on force with a government might be a necessary evil in a way. We talked about that. We talked about how capitalism has been compromised by the tyrannical governments. We talked about healthy selfhood and individualism. And we talked about that tyrannical government being a reflection of inner darkness of individuals in the collective. And we had a real talk about immigration and borders. And we had an unslaved perspective on multi multicultural multiculturalism. For some reason, that was a hard word to pronounce. But that is a big topic in their show. And it's definitely not a very PC-friendly topic. I mean, we didn't get into some sort of like white supremacy bashing other races. By no means are 
we talking about that sort of uh, stance against multiculturalism. But we got into a very interesting topic, nonetheless, discussing how mass immigration of people with conflicting ideologies into another zone of the people that they have like whole scriptures that they consider holy that tell them that they're war against, you know, talked about why that might be a bad idea to just let happen unchecked. Important conversation to have. And it's not something I'm going to make like a main thrust of the show or anything. I tend to want to stay talking about art and creativity. But part of the hero's journey of an artist is involved in becoming a spiritual warrior if you want to be authentic and figure out who you truly are. That was one of the big topics in the latter half of the Plus Extension was about growing the spine of a warrior in the fight to know yourself. And there was plenty more we talked about. I couldn't just give it all away. It was a great Plus Extension. Hope some of you will sign up and check that out. And I hope some of you check out unslave.com and David's personal blog and podcast, wayofthetruthwarrior.com. And you can also find in the show notes links to subscribe to Plus and links to those two websites I just mentioned as well as the episode music that I featured for this podcast, which was by Omni, a guy I just found, and I'm really digging. Hope he makes more music for me in the future. (laughs) Actually, I hope he makes it for himself, but I'll enjoy it. So I've been on quite a good ramble here, and there's plenty more I could say. Well, first I'll say check uh, check out the links to see a link to the Springfield Metaphysical Fair. Sorry, that took me a second to get out. (laughs) It's late here in the studio. Springfield Metaphysical Fair is in my hometown, Springfield, Missouri. So if you're near the local area and you've got some free time on Saturday, November 2nd, or Sun, no, Friday, November 2nd, Saturday, November 3rd, then come over and hang out at my booth. There's going to be live music. There's going to be people with all kinds of crystals and handmade goodies and energy healers and psychics and all kinds of crazy shit. (laughs) I like that kind of stuff. It's a great place to network with people who are thinking outside the box. And I'd love to see some of you there. Another thing I wanted to mention real quick was I was recently a guest on Nathan's Freedom Zone. Nathan Crabtree is a person who's been on the podcast a few times, and he's a good friend of mine. He's throwing Freedom Fest coming up in May in Ava, Missouri. We talked about that, but we also talked a lot about things that were on my mind from this talk with David. So it's almost like a part two of this conversation, but with the the other side, someone who's still very more convinced on uh, anarchy philosophy. Not that I think either person is wrong. It was just a cool, it was a cool follow up for me. So I'll link that in the show notes as well. It's on my website too. So check out Nathan's Freedom Zone. Great podcast in general. And that's it. Thanks to, thanks to all of you for listening. This has been one of my favorite episodes to put out, and I hope that you find it interesting, enjoyable, useful. Uh, if you check out Wilhelm Reich, that'll be useful, I promise. It's been really helpful to me learning how to release some pent-up tensions in my body that I don't even normally perceive. And all it takes is some attention and intention and some action, and you've got a recipe for change, alchemy, personal growth. All right. Well, I love you guys. Patreon.com forward slash universe is where you can sign up for plus. Check the show notes for links to everything we talked about and be good out there. Love you all. Bye-bye.